Good morning and welcome to our service. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Whether it's your first time here or you're a regular attender, we want to encourage you to take some time to fill out one of the connection cards. As you just learned, we are giving everybody the gift of Right Now Media. Right Now Media has a lot of content that is going to help you grow in your faith. And there's even content for your kids. There's Veggie Tales and there are apologetics, which means that it's ways for you to defend your faith. So if you haven't already done so, make sure and take some time to fill out the connection card and write in your email address and we'll add you to that list so you can get your free account. If you have a prayer request, make sure and fill it out. And as soon as the service is done, you could drop it off at the black box right by the entrance. If you're a believer in Jesus, man, death should be a party. Death, where is that staying? I ain't afraid of death, bring it. Not right now, but you know. <laughs> That's right, man, you're gonna wanna come to my funeral. <laughs> I'm gonna put the fun in funeral. <laughs> it's gonna be hard to be sad, I got a big bowl of candy on my chest. That is gonna help some people, man. People walking by my casket, I can't believe you're gone, I can't believe, Smarties, oh my God. I love Smarties. Somebody takes two pieces, I grab their arm. <laughs> Come on. Coming to my funeral, man, there's gonna be dancing, man. I'm gonna have music and a DJ. Mm. Just throw your hands in the air and wave them like it ain't in there. <laughs> oh, come to my funeral, man. It's gonna be great. There's gonna be a mosh pit, man. And don't just let me lay there. <laughs> Get me involved. Pick me up, let me crowd surf. Just... Join us tonight at 6 p.m. for a movie night featuring Christian comedian Tim Hopkins. The teens will be selling concessions to raise funds for a trip we're heading to this summer called The Truth Pursuit. So make sure to invite your friends and family and head on over. Make sure and check out your worship programs for more events and connection points happening here in the church. You can also go to our website, which is wadinaepicenter.church, and check them out there. All the info and dates and details will be on there. Also, after the second service, make sure and join us in the kids' area for some cake celebrating Sarah Steinkoff, our children's coordinator, as she just finished up her studies of children's ministry. So make sure and head on over and celebrate with her. Sometimes life feels difficult. You know, there's different things that we go through, and it's difficult to get through it. Uh, it it's so much easier just thinking of throwing the towel than to keep on pushing forward because everything that lies ahead just seems so difficult. And when we look at life in the perspective of that clip, sometimes we're just trying to aim for the 20-yard 20, 20 line. You know, as, lo as long as we can get there, that's good enough. We're not aiming for the end. We're just aiming for the 20. What happens is that we lower our standards. You know, we, we begin to lower our standards as Christians. We begin to say, well, I just need to get to the 20, and that's really as far as I need to get. We are unmotivated to do the things that we know we're supposed to do and to live the life that we've been called to live especially when our motivators are people that are motivating us to, to stop or people that are motivating us to do what we know is not beneficial. We don't live in a way that we are growing more and more dependent on the power of God. We are living in such a way that we're growing more and more dependent on our own strength and ability, which doesn't go very far. And that's the issue. You know, when we, when we look at life, the life of people that are trying to do things on, in their own strength, the issue is that when they try to do things to a certain point, it, it falls short. We can't get any further. We hit a tap out, you know. And we, we can't do it. We're, we're maxed out and we're just breath in. And that's the reason because, or the reason that happens is because we don't have the ability to go through such a difficult life on our own. Sometimes what we do is we find, ourse find ourselves tired of life. We're depressed with life. Life seems to have no meaning. You know, King Solomon says that in the book of Ecclesiastes over and over again. And we get to the point where we just hate what life has become. Because we're trying to do it on our own. And sometimes we see the life that this book describes that we should live and it seems unattainable. It seems so difficult because we, we look at the Bible and we're like, okay, well, that one I nailed. You know, I, I, I got that one down. But then there's other parts of scriptures that were like, that one's a little bit too difficult and I don't think that God would want me to do that. It seems far-fetched. But God doesn't call us to lower our standards. 
Sometimes we look at this life that God has called us to, and it's like standing in a football field, and we're looking at the end zone. We're standing on the other end, and we're just looking at it, and we lower our bar. You know, we lower the bar and we say, if I could just get to the 50 or if I could just get to the 40 or the 30 or the 20, and sometimes we don't even move. We accept this supposedly life-changing message that leaves us the same. We look exactly the same. We're not living supernatural. We're just living living exactly the same as when we started. When we do this, when we don't move, when we don't continue to move, what we're doing is we're lowering our standards and we're not only doing that, but we're limiting what God can do and we're limiting what the Holy Spirit in us can do through the power of God. We begin to lower and lower the standards. And we will have days that are that getting to the goal is going to be, it's going to seem overbearingly hard because sometimes looking like Christ Actually, not sometimes, every day of my life, it is difficult to try to look like Christ, especially when you face difficult situations in your life. When you're struggling with sin, when you're doing things that you know are difficult that you shouldn't do, sometimes we're like the guy in the video. We just want to stop, take a break. We want to breathe. We want to not struggle. And we're, we do that in our lives, you know? I just don't want to continue to push forward right now. I don't want to continue to live like Christ. I want to in, engage in the sin that I love in my life. And I am here to tell you that aiming for the life that God has called us to is difficult. But we don't have to do it alone. We don't have to settle for a quarter or half of the full life that God has promised us in Scripture. We don't have to lower the bar just because you're growing tired, just because you feel like you shouldn't continue to push forward. Understand that grace does not become the buffer for us, for us to stop moving forward. In, in this life of, of, of following Jesus, it's going to cost us pain. It's going to cost us sweat. It's going to cost us tears, friends, family, heartache. It's going to take setting your preferences aside, setting your emotions aside, whatever I want, whatever I feel. And we have to continue to pursue God more and more every day. And we have the Spirit of God who is in us that will walk with us, that will continue to lead us to the life that God has called us to. Like we talked about last week, by teaching us, reminding us, convicting us, leading us to that life so that we could get to the end zone. And it's going to be painful along the way. But we're never going to compromise the truth. When we look at Scripture, we can't compromise the truth that this book holds. Because this is it. The Spirit of God is always going to lead us to live to a higher standard. Unfortunately, we live in a culture that continues to lower that standard. We talked about it uh, a, a series ago, how we continue to lower our standards. But understand that everything that we read in Scripture, don't just pick and choose. As we read at Scripture, it continues to tell us that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to live to a higher standard. And the Holy Spirit, we talked about this last week, is going to convict us of the garbage, of the sin in our lives that doesn't belong there. The, the very thing that separated us from God, as we sang the song, Reckless Love, that, that's the entire message of it. Sin defected us from the perfection that God had created after sin entered the world, but God in his mercy and his love and his grace came, gave, gave himself up for us so that we could have eternal life, bringing us back to himself, but understand that he left the 99 to come for the one that was lost. And I was one that was lost, but I'm not going back to the mess to be lost again. God has called us to a different life. And sometimes when, when we're going through this life, we're, we're not looking for the Spirit of God. We're looking for more motivational speakers. We're looking for people that are going to motivate us not to do the right things, but to do the things that we're already doing and encouraging us to do it. Or if not, to live a life that is going to feel good in this planet. You know, people like Joe Osteen, and I am going there. Uh, so, you know, Joe Osteen, He's a pastor of a huge church in Texas, the great state of Texas. I love Texas because I grew up there. But, you know, Joel Osteen really talks about the gospel, that we will get everything that we want out of this life. And then when we look at the apostles, when we look at the people in the Bible that follow Jesus, they endured hardship, and every single one of them was martyred except John. He was imprisoned on the island of Patmos when he wrote the book of Revelation. The life that God has called us to isn't one that's going to be easy. There will be persecution. There will be slander. There will be things that are going to make it difficult, but we don't have to go through it alone. We have to look for 
for people, we have to look for the Spirit of God who will motivate us not to, not to hear what we want to hear. I mean, the Bible tells us that as the end draws near, there will be people that will only want to hear what they want to hear. Their itching ears want to hear. We have to understand that we don't need people that are going to tell us what we want to hear. They're not going to approve of what we have to say or what we want to live by. And we don't have to find people like that. What we have to find is the Spirit of God who dwells in us, motivating us to do and to move forward to the life that God has called us to. And we are going to do it not in our own strength, not in our own power, but by the power that's working in us, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. And that doesn't mean that we live to the lowered standards of the world. We raise that standard because we understand that that's what this life, that's, that's what this book calls us to. And we continue to move further, as painful as it seems. When we, you know, during the last three weeks, we've been talking about uh, the, the supernatural gift of the Holy Spirit and that we are in engaging. Ephesians 6 tells us that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood enemies, but against the spiritual principalities of this world. We're engaging in a supernatural power. And last week, we talked about the power of the Holy Spirit that helps us to remind us of how we should live, that teaches us how we should live, that convicts us of how we should live. And it, he guides to the life that we are called to live. And because we know that this, this gift, Jesus gives us this gift, and he assures us that he will never leave us. The Spirit of God will never leave us. And he tells us this, Jesus, in John 14, 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. And so, very simple verse, and in this passage, Jesus continues to go further and further into the life that we've been called to. So, Jesus is saying, I am going to ask the Father, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate that is never going to leave you. And it's reassuring, right? As we think about the Holy Spirit for the believer, uh, it, he will never leave us. He's always going to be there with us. Now, I want to dig a little bit further into the word advocate, because if you have your Bibles, if you look at the word advocate in this verse, it has a footnote. And in the footnote, it has something in the bottom where it tells you what the word is translated from. Now, the word that is translated is derived from the word parakletos, uh, which is a Greek word. And this Greek word is paraclete in English. So paraclete is formed this way. Para, which means alongside, and kletos, which means to call. Paraclete in Greek, parakletos, actually means to call alongside. What Jesus is giving us is this incredible gift of the Holy Spirit who will come and actually be alongside of us. See, as we're going through difficulty in life, now we understand that we don't have to go through it alone because the advocate will come and be alongside of us. Now, in, this, in the footnote, you will know that there are different words that, is that are used in regards to breaking down this word of paraclete. So the word that, that is given to us, the promise that is given to us, is the Spirit of God who will motivate us, who will guide us, and who will come alongside of us to do life in this, in this world that is going to be difficult. When we feel like we are alone, we are reassured by Jesus that the Spirit of God, His Spirit, will never leave us. God's children are given a gift and a promise. And I want to focus on that because um, we're living in a culture that it's so difficult. I mean, it, yesterday was just like a bad news day. You know, it seems like there's just so many things going on in the world and, you know, the authority of the Bible is being questioned, you know, and, and so many people taking things out of context when it comes to the Bible. As we look at the Bible, we have to understand a couple of things. One is that this is a blueprint. I mean, if you, if you know anything about construction or you know anything about trying to assemble anything, a blueprint is always helpful because it helps you to understand how something should be built and how something should go. Now, as we look at it as a blueprint, this blueprint tells us that God's children are to live a certain way. The issue is we have outsiders, and yes, I'm calling them outsiders, people that are not in the faith, who are looking at Scripture and they're saying, well, there's all these promises. There's all these promises that are for me. And I'm here to tell you, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible makes promises to God's children of the things that we will receive. So there are many people that will question authority of the Bible. They'll just take one verse, take it out of context. But the other thing that we do is we say, well, God promised this. Yes, God promised that to his children. Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands right? So it becomes to set a platform, it starts to set a platform as to who those promises are made for. 
The promise that we are given is the paraclete, the paraclete who comes alongside of us for those who are in Christ. So you don't get to say, well, I love the promises, but I hate the lifestyle. You know, no, I mean, that, that doesn't entitle you to a promise. You're just an entitled person. You feel like you deserve all the good things, but you don't want to submit to God's word. So when we look at scripture from beginning to end, it continues to give promises to God's people. And as we look at those promises, one of the promises is the promised spirit of God, the Holy Spirit who will reside in us. Which means for the believer, once again, I'm going to focus very much on that. For the believer, that means that we have the Spirit of God who comes alongside of us during the moments that we feel deserted, that we feel like we have no one else in life. And those moments are difficult, right? For some people, it looks very different. Some people maybe have gone through a divorce and that's been the, the, the most difficult moment of your life. Maybe you've lost a job. Maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've uh, lost everything, you know, that, that you consider dearly. And those are difficult moments in life. When we face those moments as children of God, we don't have to face them alone, which really gives us hope. And when you see people that don't know Christ but are going through difficult situations, it's difficult from an outside perspective to see how they're going to deal with it because it seems so overbearing. About two years ago, we got to see this. Uh, I was in a missions trip in Texas and Aaron, Ra- Aaron Rondesved, who was part of our governing board, was in that trip with us. Now, it was, a, it was a great trip. We stayed at this hotel that was infested with bed bugs, which was absolutely phenomenal. Um, and, you know, when, when we got there, we didn't know this. So we got into the hotel. We got out. We were going to go to the church that we were working with. And as we were walking out, there was this guy who approached us, rough looking around the edges. And, you know, he, he approaches us and he says, hey, uh, do you have something to change a tire? And at that point, we're like, yeah, we could look. So we go and we look, and I didn't even know what I was looking for because I don't know how to change a tire. But, you know, so Aaron went and found it. And at that point, we offered to help, which translates to Aaron help change the tire. And I did what I do best, which is just talk, uh, because I have no idea how to change a tire. Uh, But, you know, he helped him, and we're talking. And as we walk over to the vehicle, we notice very quickly that there is no tire. There's just a rim, uh, a rim that is completely, you know, just bent. And there's what seems to be traces of a tire. And then at that point, we notice that there's this long scrape to where the the vehicle is parked. So out of curiosity, uh, I just decided to ask him, you know, so what's going on? You know, what what happened, you know, to the And as he started opening up, it turns out that life at home wasn't very good. He's, he's a guy probably about my age, and he, he was living with his girlfriend or with his wife. I'm not sure which one it was, but that's irrelevant. What, what begins to happen, he, he starts to tell us a story about what is going on at home. His tire got slashed. Either, I can't remember if it was by his wife or by a, his wife's relative after they got in an argument, and he wasn't going back home. So... You know, we're hearing this story and our heart all of a sudden is breaking for this guy. It's like, oh my, my goodness, you're, you're going through a difficult time in life. You know, whenever we see people that are going through difficult times in life, uh, sometimes it's easy just to turn to what we know. Well, let's just give them money to help them out. And if you give somebody money that is going through something difficult, I'm not saying that that's wrong, but that's not going to help the situation that they're in. Because what it is, it's emotional. It's not financial. They're, they're facing something difficult. They're struggling with something in the heart. If I, were to, if I would have offered to pay for his tire, that wouldn't have helped him at all either because he has nowhere to go. His wife or girlfriend doesn't want him back. So how do you help? I mean, how do you help somebody that is facing something so difficult that you can't help them. You know, I look at the passage in the Bible of the apostles, you know, after they receive the Holy Spirit, they go into this, they're going to the temple and they see this man and this man uh, has been uh, sick for a long time and he's begging for money and the disciples say, you know what, I don't have money to offer you, but I give you what I do have. And they pray for him and he's healed. And sometimes I just wish that, you know, there, there could be moments like that where I could just kind of, you know, poof, everything's gone, everything's good at home. Go back home and everything's going to be great. And sometimes that's not the way that it works, right? But we took the time to pray for him. And that's the step in the right direction. Because I don't have anything in my pockets. I don't have anything in my house that could be able to help him solve the issues that he's having. 
See, the world doesn't have medicine to try to treat the issues that he's having. The bank doesn't have money to fix the issues that he's having. What he needs is a spirit of God who can walk alongside of him. And, and there is nothing in this world, there is nothing that this world can offer him that will help him where he's at. And when we look at John 14, 27, that's what Jesus says. I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give is a gift that the world cannot give. So don't be troubled and afraid. See, when we look at scripture, it becomes obvious that this gift that God is giving us is, is a gift so valuable that it, the world can't offer it. Once again, in the last series that we talked about with Weird, it, it's, it's interesting how we go to the world to try to find satisfaction, to try to find peace, to try to find fulfillment. Yet at the same time, Jesus is clearly saying, I am leaving you with a gift, and this gift is never going to leave you, and it's a peace of mind and of heart. When, he was, when this guy was going through this difficult life, what he needed was a supernatural peace of mind and heart. And I could not offer him that, but Jesus can for those that are in Jesus, once again, I'm going to continue to articulate that. For those that are in Jesus, we can face tomorrow because the Spirit of God is walking alongside of us whatever we are facing. That even though we have fallen, even though we fall, right? We're going to fall at times. We're not going to measure up to that end zone goal, but we are continually moving towards that. But we are going to fall sometimes, and sometimes we need the Spirit of God who will come alongside of us and He'll help us up to continue to move forward. It's like the most epic version of the life alert. If you know what a life alert is, uh, it's, it's just a gadget that you hang around your neck. If you haven't seen it, it's because you don't watch Price is Right or Day of Our Lives. But <laughs> it's always on during those times. But all that you need is just this life alert, right? So if I were to fall, I grab the life alert and I hit it. And what happens is help comes my way. I can call alongside of me someone that will help me. See, as children of God, we have the Holy Spirit who we can call alongside of us when everybody has ditched us. When there is nobody left, the Spirit of God will never leave us. And because this world can't offer it, it is a supernatural ability that God gives us. It is a supernatural power that God gives us. When life has you down, when you're deserted, when you're filled with worry for today and for tomorrow, when you're consumed in your mind with everything that is going on in life, Paul reminds us of this. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. Paul's reminding us, okay, so Jesus says, why worry about tomorrow when tomorrow has its own worries, right? So there are things in life that you can't fix. Adding worry to it is really just, uh, it doesn't help it actually cripples you because now you, you're worried and you have your troubles. And Jesus is saying, you know, why worry about tomorrow when tomorrow has its own worries? And, and Paul is really reminding us, don't worry about anything. Why, why are you worried about it? Instead, pray about everything. And typically, the issue is we don't pray about stuff until it's too late. You know, until we're pretty much at the breaking point where we're depressed. And then at that point, we're like, okay, now I have to pray to God because it's out of my control. It was out of your control to begin with. Uh, th that's where you should have started. So Paul is reminding us, don't worry about anything, pray about everything, tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done, the good, the bad, everything that you're going through. And then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. See, there it goes back to that promise. So we have the Holy Spirit with us who is going to comfort us and he is going to come alongside of us. And we're going to be able to experience this supernatural peace. And we don't have to worry about trouble when we are overwhelmed with life because we can experience this supernatural peace. And for some people, this is just supernaturally awkward. They, they don't understand it. You know, it, it's, it's weird to think that you could experience something to this degree. The Holy Spirit, the paraclete, who comes alongside of us will comfort and encourage us in those times where we are facing difficult situations. See, because we have the Spirit of God who comes alongside of us, we can rest assured that He will comfort us and encourage us in those times. For some of us during difficult times, maybe we've experienced this. I mean, I know for me, I've experienced it many times during the most difficult times when I, things are out of my control. And sometimes it's, it's things like, you know, finances. Sometimes it has to do with work. But for others... Maybe it's when we've lost somebody that we cared about. 
And, you know, we, we all experience those kind of losses in our lives. I had the, the pleasure of meeting a, a really cool couple when I was working in Baxter at a church there uh, by the name of Jerry and Susan. Jerry and Susan uh, were a phenomenal cop, a couple. You know, they were very involved with the church. Uh, whenever there was something going on in the church, the church you knew that uh, Jerry and Susan were going to be there. Uh, you just knew. You, you would always see Jerry and Susan uh, in these church functions. And, uh, I mean, that's what people saw. You know, people saw Jerry and Susan all the time in church. But what people didn't see was the other side of Jerry and Susan. And it was a side that I wish everybody would have seen. As a pastor of the church, I, I would be there during office hours where nobody else was there, you know, just the staff. And Jerry and Susan would spend time with people, discipling them, teaching them about God's word, encouraging them, encouraging them in their faith, talking to them, investing into their marriage, doing things that, you know, people that are selfless do. They were so giving, not only with their time, but that you could just, you could just feel the love that Jerry and Susan had for Jesus. It, it was evident in their own life, and it was evident in, the, in what they were pouring into the lives of others. And for me, Jerry and Susan really set a really high standard as to how we should live. Because, I mean, if I were to aim for somebody's life, it would be like, yeah, I want to be like Jerry and Susan. I want, I want to be that older couple, that girl's old. I want to be that person that, you know, as, as I'm getting older, I'm investing more and more into the lives of others. I'm emptying myself so that I could understand the fullness of God in me. Jerry and Susan were selfless, generous, encouraging, and once again, the love of Jesus was just pouring out of them. You could see it in their lives, and you could see how the Holy Spirit was working in their lives and how they lived. So about less than a year ago, I learned that Jerry was in a car accident. And uh, they, they had been married for a long time, once again, a couple between 60 and 70, somewhere in there. And um, unfortunately, Jerry passed away September 29th of 2018. And your heart just breaks for Susan. It's like, you know, how do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, you lost your best friend of I don't know how many years. He's gone. And you have to figure out how to cope with life. And even though her, her future had been altered forever, her outlook her perspective of what had happened was incredible. It was mind-boggling. I mean, it was honestly supernatural. For, for her, she was comforted knowing of the life that her husband had lived, and she was comforted knowing that she would see her husband again. And, and once again, I'm going to dig a little bit into this very quickly, but there are many people that believe that they're going to heaven without any context of their lives actually looking like Christ. But for her, she was, she was completely convinced that she would see her husband again. She is convinced because it's true. I really believe it to be true. And she was comforted that, by that. And now the interesting part is, as you scroll through the, through the page on Facebook, it was interesting how people were comforted by Susan's comfort. It, it's interesting. Susan was being comforted by the Holy Spirit that it was going to be okay and people were drawing comfort from Susan that everything was going to be okay. As I saw that, it, it's interesting how the, the Holy Spirit does such a work that it starts to impact and have ripple effects on others. As she was being encouraged by the Spirit of God, she, her, her encouragement was so contagious that for me, I was encouraged understanding this is a person that understands the concept of life, that this isn't all there is, that there is more to life, that Jerry, we will see him one day in eternity because he lived a life where I truly believe that Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. See, when we see people like that, the, the, the Holy Spirit is working in such a way that it is not only contagious, the Spirit of God and how, how he's working in their lives, but it's contagious in how he's comforted, comforting and encouraging them as well. And to me, it's comforting knowing that one day I will see Jerry as well. I, I really loved and appreciated Jerry. And one day we will all stand before the throne of God and we will give account for how we lived. 
and understand that we have an accuser. We talked about that in the first week of the series. We have an accuser. We find it in the book of Job where, where it says that the accuser came and he was accusing Job of all these things. Now, we understand that we have an accuser, but we also have an advocate which defends us. And because we have an advocate who defends us, we can take comfort knowing that we have someone who is fighting for us because we have someone that is fighting against us. We have the Holy Spirit fighting for us because we have the devil who is fighting against us. And it's comforting, right? When you're going in a battle, it's comforting to know that someone has your back. It's interesting, just thinking about this concept, I've been married, I'm going on 15 years of marriage, December 18th of this year. And it's really cool to think about it this way. My wife, there is nobody else that knows me more personally and intimately than my wife. She knows pretty much everything about my life because I've experienced a life with her where she knows my struggles and she knows my strengths. She knows what makes me tick and she knows what makes me laugh. She knows what I love and what I hate. She knows who I am and who I'm not. And it's great to have somebody like that who knows me intimately. Because there are times where people will talk, and in my line of work, you always take punches from every side. You know, it's like everybody has an opinion, everybody, uh, you know, has a better way of doing things, and sometimes you just take punches from every side. And it's great to have somebody who understands who I am, because during the, those difficult times, it's good to be able to press on to her and say, okay, is this really true? And she'll be honest, she'll be like, oh, well, this one might be true. And then when it's not, she's like, that's not who you are. See, it's great to have somebody that can advocate for who I am, who understands me to such a degree. My wife becomes my greatest advocate in those battles, but not because she always tells me that everything is good, but because she tells me when I am wrong. To have an advocate who will shape me into a better person. And that is the role of the Holy Spirit as the advocate, is somebody who knows you intimately because he dwells in us. He comes alongside us, but because he's in us, he understands everything about who we are. He is not against us. He is for us. And he becomes our greatest defender. If you've ever been in a courtroom, which um, I hope you haven't, but if you have, or if you watch a lot of movies, uh, when you're in, in a courtroom, you, it's great to have somebody that's going to defend you because the other person is trying to pretty much uh, go against you and take everything from you. But to have an advocate who is for you, it's great to have somebody that is going to fight for you, but is also going to give you wise counsel, wise advice. Now, the issue is you, you have a choice in that. You could take the counsel, you could take the advice, or you could leave it. And if you have a good paralegal, a legal practitioner who is able to help you fight your case, the advocate is always going to give you advice that will benefit you. And here's the reason that this, this matters. As believers, we have to understand what 2 Corinthians 5.10 says. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. So here's, here, here's the deal. It's interesting how, you know, I was, there was a thread in regards to, um, I can't remember what the issue was. It was a significant political issue that was, that was being discussed. And in this discussion, there was people that were pretty much saying, hey, I like this part of the Bible. I like this chapter. And it says that God is love. And because God is love, he will not judge us. And I mean, those were the exact words from this person that I had never met. And I felt, uh, you know, just that is true that God is love, but it is not true that he is not judge because it's written all over scripture. I, I mean, it is. In the book of Matthew, it says that uh, he will separate the sheep from the goats, right? He's a judge. We must all stand before Christ to be judged. One day, every single human being that roams this planet will give account for the way that they lived, for the good or the evil. And because we have a loving God that was willing to sacrifice everything for us, we understand that he is love. But because he is good, we have to understand that he is just. He is just and he will punish the wrong for the wrong. If he wasn't completely honest, if he wasn't an honest judge, then he can't be truly good. If he's willing to say, you know what, you've been bad, but I'm going to call you good, that's not a good judge. That's a terrible judge. A judge will punish the wrong. And we understand that by grace we have been saved. We are saved on the merit of what Christ did at the cross. But at the same time, we have to understand that over and over in Scripture, we find that the way that we live 
does have a consequence. Hebrews 10, 26 says, Dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, there, listen to this, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. See, if we continue to sin after we understand the truth of it, there is no longer any sin that, or there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. Hebrews 10, 26. Understand that because we have a good advocate, we have somebody that, that is fighting for us, he is going to advise us. He is going to tell us what we need to hear for our benefit so that we could stand before the judge and say, he can say, well done, good and faithful servant. One day I will stand before the judge and I will give account for everything that I did in my life. The advocate's role is going to be to convict us, to advise us of the life that God has called us to. And because one day we stand before the judge, we, we, have to, we have to have an advocate. We are made right with God on the merit of grace, but we are identified as children of God on the response of obedience. See, we, obedience doesn't save us. Your works aren't going to be what saves you. But obedience becomes the evidence of salvation. Because I'm in this relationship with God, obedience is part of my life. The life that Jesus calls us to is difficult at times, and it looks a lot like that opening clip where we just want to throw in the towel. But looking at that video clip, once again, I want to wrap it up with this, but as you look at that video, there are so many things to take away from it. For one is, you will have the world, because let's be honest, if we stand completely 100% on this book, we, are, we have a message that is not popular. I mean, we, we do. It's, it's not a popular message to stand firm on 100% from beginning to end of everything having to do in this Bible. You do not carry a popular message if you stand completely on the Word of God. But we stand on it, and sometimes the way that it begins to look is we're crawling through this life. And there's people in the sidelines that are, sidelines that are laughing. They're saying, you can't do this. And they're the greatest critics. They're, they're the voice that we're hearing. But then alongside of you comes the Holy Spirit and continues to say, don't quit. Keep on going. Keep on moving. You can do it. Keep going. And there's days that we feel like giving up. And he continues to say, go, keep going, keep going. Ten more, ten more, ten more. It's every single step. And it's going to cost us pain. It's going to cost us heartache. But the advocate is next to us. And we don't just have to do it in our own strength. Next week, as we wrap up this series, we're going to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in us, that allows us to live this supernatural life. We've learned about the work and the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But because I'm unable to do this life in my own strength, I know that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. See, it takes the focus off of what I can do and puts the focus of what God can do through me. I can continue to press forward because the Spirit of God goes before me, walks beside me, and stands behind me. I have every side covered. Let's pray.